All right, well, good morning. Thank you um, for having me on this panel. It's such an amazing group. Um, I think, Dr. Laurier, you, you should market your videos as some sort of meditation for surgeons. That was relaxing. <laughs> And then Dana, you got me nervous again, so. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna be talking about um, complications and how we work up the patient um, when they come in postoperatively and where, how we know what to do when we're finding um, things that don't quite add up. So just to put it in perspective, inguinal hernia repair, um, I think we know this by now, but um, we do 20 million operations um, for inguinal hernia repair worldwide. And so even though these complications are low, Overall, that's still a large number of patients that are being affected by this. We know that the incidence of inguinal hernias um, increases with age, and so particularly after the age of 50 to 70. And something that's kind of new that's been developing recently is our management of these patients over 50 has changed a little bit. So patients that are asymptomatic but have a hernia, um, we're actually shifting more towards watchful waiting and a large component of that is related to the amount of complications we're seeing, so it's significant. So when we think about postoperative complications, um, really I divide these when I look at these patients into three main categories. Is it a wound problem? Is there a bulge that we need to address? Um, or is it a pain problem? And pain's obviously the hardest one, so we'll get to that. Um, we'll kind of save some extra time for that. But really when we're thinking about complications, I think the management of these starts the first day that you meet a patient. Um, because really informed consent is so critical for these patients. And I think a lot of us are probably glossing over some of the pain and some of the, the incidents that we do see in these patients. So I always take a lot of time to talk to my patients about what we see, what they need to be looking for after surgery, and really try to partner with them so that they know what, they're well informed to know what to look for afterwards. So if there is a problem, we know about it early. So for postoperative wound complications, these are kind of the most straightforward to deal with. Um, surgical site infections, superficial surgical site infections occur in about 3 to 5% of patients, and usually these can be treated with oral um, or IV antibiotics. The most common organism is Staphylococcus aureus, um, and so that's usually what you want to make sure that you're covering for. For deeper surgical site infections, um, and these are fortunately rare, 0.1, 0.2%, um, something around there. These are a little bit of a bigger problem, especially when there's a prosthetic in there. So these patients will usually present with more um, kind of general symptoms, so fever, chills, malaise. On exam, when you look at where their groin incision is, um, they will have erythema, warmth, induration, or drainage. And these are patients that definitely need some imaging. So you can start with ultrasound or CT abdomen pelvis. That's my preferred. And really what you're looking for is a fluid collection, edema, or stranding around the mesh treatment, it's okay to start with antibiotics and percutaneous drainage. I think we always think that we just have to get in there and get all that mesh out. But it's okay to take a little bit of a more measured approach, particularly if this is early. Um, and they can, this treatment with just antibiotics and percutaneous drainage can have up to a 76% um, salvage rate. So worth a try. But if there's recurrent infection or you're not seeing an improvement, you do need to move to surgical debridement and likely mesh excision. Predictors of success. Macroporous polypropylene mesh um, and biologics have the highest rate of salvage, with PTFE having the highest rate of excision. Oops, let's see. So here's just a CT, um, just showing this patient had a left open inguinal hernia repair, and we're seeing kind of some stranding um, around his mesh, which is still in good position, but ultimately had to be removed. All right, what about a bulge? Um, so. Like all of these things, particularly in management of pain, which we'll talk about, I think a lot of this comes down to a really good history and physical. And so when a patient comes to me saying, you know, I have a bulge after surgery, I think my hernia is back, I want to know, has this been present since surgery? Did it show up a day or two later, a week later? Was your surgery 20 years ago? You know, the timing is important for helping to narrow down your differential. Um, is it present, um, or has there been recent exertion? In Minnesota, it's always snow shoveling. Um, so they were doing well, and then they had to <laughs> get their car out of the garage, so they shoveled, and they felt a searing pain. So a little higher risk of recurrence, maybe, in that case. What about when they lay down? Is it present there, or does it reduce? Is there surrounding ecchymosis? And so ultrasound or CT, um, again, I would probably favor CT for these patients. But really what we're looking at are these main three things. Um, seroma, hematoma, and recurrence. Seroma occurs in 0.5 to 15% of patients after inguinal hernia repair, 
It should be present when they're supine uh, most of the time. And this usually peaks around seven to 10 days. Um, it generally will resolve on its own, and risk factors include large um, direct hernias and inguinal scrotal her hernias. Hematomas are also common, um, sadly, complications. And often there'll be some surrounding ecchymosis, but not always. Um, these usually occur with a little bit closer to the time of operation, so within the first 24, 48 hours. Um, and just keep in mind that if you're thinking about an anterior approach for a poster versus a posterior approach, they might have present a little bit differently. So if you have a large um, hematoma from a posterior approach, they might present with more hemodynamic instability. They're not going to have maybe the obvious bruising that you'd see if you have a hematoma from like an open approach. So just have a high index of suspicion and get some imaging. And then recurrence, this can range from 0.2 to 10%, and this really depends on kind of the type of hernia, the comorbidities, um, and how long it's been since their original operation. So a little caveat to don't be fooled. Um, this is one of my um, patients that I had who unfortunately um, developed a hematoma after surgery. He it was a recurrent hernia repair. Um, he had a very large inguinoscrotal defect. I had to peel the sac off the testicular artery. It was kind of attached to that really well-developed cremasteric fibers, and 24 hours after surgery, he says, my hernia is back, I have this huge bulge, and he did have a pretty big bulge. Um, and so I did an ultrasound, which I put two of those pictures on the top here, and the ultrasound actually is read as a recurrent hernia, but it didn't make sense with what I was seeing on exam, and so I did a CT scan, and it was actually kind of a hematoma and seroma with some swelling, um, and the CT scan showed that that's all it was, there wasn't a recurrence. So if it doesn't match up, just get more imaging, get more information. Uh -oh. Can you go to the next slide, please? Let's see, sorry guys. Okay, so what about recurrence? Um, so the lowest rate of recurrence we see with the tension-free closure, and that can be open, um, modified Liechtenstein, or a TEP, or a TAP um, from a uh, minimally invasive approach. Shouldice also has a low recurrence rate, kind of that one to 2%, but only at high volume centers. CT is really helpful to determine your previous mesh location um, and the anatomy um, and just kind of get a better game plan and roadmap for what you need to do. And really critical is if you didn't operate on this patient, make sure you're taking the time to get those outside op notes um, because the devil is in the details. With management, um, I won't touch on this too much because that'll be covered by Ian, but um, in general, it's the opposite approach. So if they had an anterior uh, repair that's failed, think about going posteriorly and vice versa. If they've had both and it's failed, um, really think about your skill set. Is this something that you feel comfortable going after? Or is this somebody that needs to be referred to a hernia specialist? All right, let's talk about pain here a little bit. These, I think, are the most challenging patients. Um, and really, when we think about chronic post-operative pain for inguinal hernias, um, this is pain lasting beyond six, you, it's kind of starting at three, but definitely beyond six months after surgery. The incidence is eight to 16%, and it significantly impacts acti activities of daily living in 0.5 to 6% of patients. Um, interestingly, there's no difference really in chronic pain with intentional nerve division at one year after um, surgery. So we see some early differences there, but at one year that doesn't really pan out. And we're talking about neuropathic foreign body or mesh sensation um, and scar um, pain. That's kind of what we have to differentiate. So diagnosis, obtain all outside op reports. You're going to hear me say that a bunch of times. Um, think about a progressive step-up approach. And so really with your history and physical, you want to know what kind of characterized this pain. So what's the location and radiation? When did it start? Was it they woke up from surgery and they had this searing pain? Did they have a period of time where they didn't have any pain? And then it gradually has kind of started to um, crescendo. What helps it? What hurts it? Um, and do they have a foreign body sensation? So... Um, I'm sure we've all had patients that come in and they say, you know, it just feels like I'm, they've had an anterior approach with mesh. They say, it just feels like I'm wearing tight jeans and I have my keys in my front pocket or I have a deck of cards sitting there. You know, that's mesh probably that's crumpled up. Um, pain mapping is critical and we're gonna spend some time talking about that. And then imaging. So think about CT for these patients. Um, sometimes MRI um, can be really helpful. It's okay to start with watchful waiting for the first few months to start with some basic analgesics. You can use topical analgesics, but these haven't really been shown to have any sort of long-term effect on pain. 
It's okay to refer to a pain specialist, and they might do a trial of NSAIDs, gabapentinoids, TCIs, um, SSRIs, and SNRIs. And then think about a multidisciplinary approach. So if it's right after your hernia repair, it's probably related to that. But if it's kind of distant from their hernia repair, or if it's not adding up with their history and physical, think about getting other people involved. And so at Mayo, we have a group um, that involves myself, physical medicine, um, and rehab, orthopedics, and pain. And often we'll see all these patients together and just see is there something else, you know, might be the hernia, but is there something else going on? You can start with local anesthetic injections. Um, there's not a lot to lose with this. These are safe and minimally invasive. It's usually a combination of lidocaine, steroids, and hyaluronic acid. And there is, um, there is some efficacy of it, and I use them more as kind of diagnostic. If there's some benefit from them, then I think these are patients that might benefit more from an erectomy. So I think they're kind of diagnostic and therapeutic. Um, radiofrequency ablation has also shown some promise. Um, I haven't seen a ton of success with this in my own personal patients, but it's worth a try. All right, so pain. So really we need to break this into nociceptive or non-neuropathic pain um, and, or versus neuropathic pain. Nociceptive is most common, and this is usually damage to tissues from kind of rupture or surgical trauma, uh, just from recovering from the surgery itself. It can also be pain from foreign bodies, granulomas, um, stitches that are in there, or calcia. Neuropathic pain usually shows up early in the postoperative period, and so these are often patients that will say, I woke up and I had pain, or I haven't ever felt good since my surgery. Um, there's usually damage to one or more nerves, and these nerves can be, um, they can be cut, and that might be intentionally we cut them, thinking we were doing something good, um, or it can be accidental cutting. They often can be entrapped by suture or tacks, um, and this pain is persistent, severe, it's electrical. Um, I had one patient describe it as, felt like they had a stiletto jammed in their groin. Um, so it's pain that gets their attention and doesn't go away. Um, the most common nerves affected by both MIS and open approaches are the ilioinguinal and then the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve. Um, and we particularly see that when plugs have been used in the past or if there's been round ligament that was cut kind of close to the ring. Femoral um, branch of the genitofemoral nerve is often more involved in the lap approach, and often this is more from kind of tension or stretch. So that might improve over time, but if it doesn't, you still may need to address that with the neurectomy. Um, I cannot... Uh, kind of put a big enough plug for this book. Um, I know it's at Sages, um, but uh, this is, it's just really helpful. And um, this, if you don't have this, I would add this to your collection because it's just a great thing to kind of look for, uh, look through and get algorithms for the problems that you're seeing. Um, but there's a great chapter on dermatome mapping, with I which I hope you're all familiar with, but just in case, we'll make sure we talk about it today. And so dermatome mapping is really just trying to narrow down where is the pain, what type of pain is this? And it's very simple. You just use a regular ballpoint pen, um, and you can use, is described with a red, black, and blue pen, or you can just do plus, minuses, and zeros. And really what you're gonna do is you're gonna push on the patient, kind of while lying supine, starting at the asis, and moving in one inch increments, kind of medially. So you're gonna go over to the umbilicus, and then you're gonna carry this down to the upper thigh, and then also to the upper scrotum or labia, okay? You start with a control point, which is on the opposite side of the umbilicus, just so people know if this is what normal sensation feels like. And then you're looking for pain, numbness, um, or normal sensation. And then there's this kind of scoring system, which can help make sure that we all have, sorry, I lost my mouse here, guys, but um, just a way to describe it. Okay, so these are taken directly from uh, Dr. Alvarez's uh, chapter in that book. And so this is just an example. And here the red, um, kind of the first picture is showing right ilioinguinal nerve involvement. The middle is left genital branch involvement, left um, hypogastric for the third picture. Just kind of run through these. You guys can look at these. But it's important to do this preoperatively and sometimes a couple times. If I have patients that have chronic pain, we're trying different things, I check, I come back to this and I check it, you document it, take a picture, put it in their chart. And so um, here we see kind of left femoral nerve involvement. Sorry, you're just going to have to follow with me left to right. Um, left ilioinguinal and left femoral nerve involvement. And then also, so these ones on the right side of the screen are after intervention. So after neurectomy, they should have numbness in these areas. So really helpful for providing a roadmap. Okay, a couple more here. These are just nociceptive pain, so um, orgalgia, pubalgia, and then if it doesn't really follow any normal distribution, 
then you got to think, um, is this patient, is there something else going on? Is this patient kind of telling the truth? Um, just there might be something else going there. So that should raise some flags. Um, this is one of my own patients that actually Dr. David Chen, um, I consulted with him on. This is a patient who'd had an anterior approach with mesh, had pain, that mesh was removed, had a posterior approach with mesh um, and had pain. He'd had a previous open neurectomy and still had pain. Um, and so I did a number of dermatome maps on him. Um, Dr. Chen actually did one with me. And what we discovered is he still had pain in his ilioinguinal nerve distribution. Um, and I had been thrown off a little bit because he'd, had, he'd been operated by a great surgeon and he had a great neurectomy um, from what I thought. Who's, that's, the surgeon has great results. And so I kind of thought, oh, I don't think it could be that. But um, emboldened by Dr. Chen's exam, um, I went back in there and sure enough, he had a large neuroma of his ilioinguinal nerve, and so we resected that. Um, and then I did a hybrid approach. I also took out his mesh robotically on, um, that had been placed laparoscopically. And in looking through the op reports um, in preparation for that, I saw that the surgeon dictated he had a left-sided barred 3D max mesh. They had no right-sided mesh, so he just flipped it inside out and put it in. And so if you can see um, on his MRI, sorry, I don't have my mouse, but um, you can kind of see the pointy edge. Oh, this thing? Okay. Um, so see the pointy edge right here of that mesh kind of um, pushing into the canal. And so we removed that, and so far he's been doing great. He's pain free. Okay. So my last um, couple slides here. So Ian will talk about this, but just when you're thinking about surgical intervention, think about a, um, a hybrid approach. Think about getting all of the foreign bodies out of there and starting fresh. And then finally, I'll just draw your attention to the blue side over here. This is Dr. Will Mayo. And he says, I would admonish you above all other considerations to be honest. I mean honesty in every conception of the word. Let it enter into the details of your work, in the treatment of your patients, and in your association with your brother practitioners. I think this is never more important than when we're dealing with complications with our patients. Know that they're scared and they need you to partner with them, kind of help explain what's going on, and um, join together to find a solution. Thank you. <laughs>